Hello everybody, welcome to Edinburgh Castle. My name is Bruce Chandler and I'm one of Historic Environment Scotland's district architects and the main part of my job involves looking after Edinburgh Castle which is uh, what I'm going to take you around today. We'll look at some of the interesting bits and pieces and I hope it'll give you a flavour of the place and entice you to come back when you're allowed to, which hopefully won't be too long. First of all up here I want to talk a bit about um, geology um, and why Castle Hill is here and why the castle is built in this position. Um, if you look over there you can see Arthur's Seat and Salisbury Crags and like Castle Rock itself they're the remains of an ancient volcano from about 340 million years ago um, which covered a large part of this area and is quite well known in geological circles because it has examples of most of the important volcanic features. Slightly more recently, 25,000 years ago, there was the Ice Age and this whole area was covered in sheets of ice and glaciers moving generally from west to east and the volcanic activity had burst through the sedimentary rocks but then when the Ice Age came and the glaciers were moving west to east down that way they eroded the softer sedimentary rocks um, and what you ended up with was the plug, volcanic plug that we're now standing on which is Castle Rock and the various other hard volcanic rocks upstanding with various bits of sedimentary rocks around them. One of the effects of the movement of the ice from west to east was that you got the typical crag and tail, the crag being Castle Rock and the tail being all the debris and the remains of the sedimentary layers going from here right down the Royal Mile down to Holyrood and the park at the bottom. We're now standing right in front of the gatehouse here. Um, this is the, the main entrance, main east elevation of the castle and was also one of the most vulnerable positions as well. If you look back towards the end of the high street uh, you'll see how close we are to the city itself. So defending this face of the castle has always been very very important and even going right back to the Iron Age when excavations were done to do with the tunnel they found remains of two Iron Age ditches in this location across in front of where the gatehouse now is. Subsequently a spur was built and that was about halfway down the present esplanade um, and the present dry ditch that we see here dates from uh, after the time of Oliver Cromwell but the, the gatehouse entrance that you see with the archway here too dates from the time of the building of the gatehouse in the 1880s. It originally had um, a sliding drop drawbridge where the timber balustrade is at the moment and the previous entrances to the castle were also equipped with standard drawbridges. So we're now going to go through the archway um, and uh, we'll look at the sculptures either side on the way and look at some armament panels actually within the arch. We're now standing in the archway of the gatehouse, that's the main visitor entrance to the castle. Um, this is, as I said, um, late 1880s this was built, but if you look up above your heads you'll see there are two carved panels, one on either side, and we think these date from the 1540s and were originally in the munitions house in Crown Square. After that they were transferred down to one of the previous gateways uh, coming into the castle just adjacent to here. Then they were taken by the Society of Antiquaries of Edinburgh into storage and then when this building was built they gave them and they are now built in here into the, into the walls. What's interesting about them is that they show the um, munitions of the time, about 1540, and they include representation of Mons Meg and a gun carriage for it. And that gun carriage that you see up there was the pattern which was used in 1936 to build the wooden carriage which Mons Meg sits on at the moment. So we now come through the gatehouse passage and standing on the inside of the gatehouse and up to my left you can see 
how intimately the man-made masonry relates to the natural rock, Castle Rock itself. The main feature that you can see here is the big curved wall of the Half Moon Battery which was built after the siege of 1573 which was one of about 20 sieges that the council was subjected to over the years. And this particular one did a huge amount of damage, including the almost total destruction of David's Tower, which actually was higher than this battery here. And the remains are actually enclosed within the battery walls. And they were only fully revealed in the early 20th century during excavations. We're now on Argyle Battery, which is in Middle Ward, and um, is a six-gun battery and looks out towards the Firth of Forth and Leith, defending the north side of this part of the castle. Um, this was uh, built in the 1730s as part of the uh, major works on the defences on this side of the castle and going around right towards the West End, which we'll see later. Um, if you look back at Argyle Tower and Portcullis Gate, which we came through a moment ago, you can see very clearly from here the difference between the medieval earlier stonework and the finer ashlar Victorian stonework up above. There's a great contrast. Um, and the, the architect responsible for that building on Argyle Tower was called Hippolyte Blanc, who was an Edinburgh architect despite his French name. Uh, he had worked for the um, Office of Works and had done quite a lot of uh, work on historic churches um, and became very interested in historic buildings, did work on uh, this building here and he also did um, a significant amount of work on the Great Hall which we'll also see later. So we've now come up um, the hill slightly from Governor's House down there um, and we're now standing on what is called Hawk Hill. Research suggests that it was called that because it was a hill which was used for hawking before these buildings on the west side of the castle were built. This would have been fairly open ground, so plenty of room for um, activities like that. Um, the new barracks is one of the buildings which was built on this side um, taking up some of that what was then vacant ground and is a very large building although you don't realize that from this side because from here all you see are three floors and some dormer windows in the roof but there are additional floors down below which were built um, to take up the difference in levels between where we are now and the slope underneath of Castle Rock going downhill towards the west and we'll see that in a bit more detail when we walk around the west side of the castle. But we're now going to walk up through Fugue's Gate and that's an interesting name in itself and research there suggested, well, there are a number of um, suggestions which have been made for that, one being Foggy Gate, which is quite appropriate for its uh, location here in Scotland just off the Forth. But um, a more likely explanation um, seems to be Old Fugie's Gate. The Old Fugies, which we would now probably call Old Fogies, were the invalids, because they used to have invalid regiments, and some of these people were sent up from uh, Chelsea um, uh, when they were past a really active service. And the suggestion was that this gate might have been manned by them because it was the one which was uh, the last in line, if you like, and uh, um, the, um, perhaps where the soldiers uh, were not as fit as um, some of the others might need to be further down towards the entrance. We're now in Crown Square, which as you can see is not exactly level, but a, a platform. And as I said before, this is built over vaults, which take up the difference in level between Castle Rock, which slopes down from that side to the south. And in here you've got the palace over here, um, and then the Great Hall, and on the Great Hall you can see various variations in the external elevation. They're the remains of old door and window openings, but the more regular setup you've got at the moment, including the parapet, the mullion transom windows, is a result of the work by Hippolyte Blanc in his restoration work of the late 19th century. 
in the centre, more or less the centre, you've got the remains of a large doorway and that we think was put in at the time of Oliver Cromwell when he first converted the building into barracks and built the internal floors which would have changed the character of the building completely and at that time it also had dormer windows added on as well. And on the north side you have the Scottish National War Memorial which again started life as a completely different building. It used to be a church and that was in the 14th century. It was then um, converted into um, a gun house, munitions house with a floor put in it. After that it became a barrack building and following on from that the barracks was adapted by Mr Billings, um, a quite well-known architect and uh, became known as the Billings Building. Um, and then in the early 20th century it was converted by Robert Lorimer to be the Scottish National War Memorial. What Lorimer did, there was a great deal of controversy about that scheme. Um, eventually he decided to use the shell of the Billings building, the barracks. He stripped out the whole of the interior and the roof, added various bits of um, sculpture and recesses on the outside and inserted a classical scheme on the inside. So inside you've got a big open hall with the various memorials. Um, and um, he employed, um, as he had on some of his previous jobs, um, lots of the best artists and craftsmen in Scotland to do the stonework, the metalwork, the stained glass windows and the other bits and pieces within the building. So we're now in the Great Hall which is a magnificent space as you can see, built up on vaults to level Castle Rock which slopes off quite steeply. The building itself was completed in about 1511. We know that because the roof timbers have been dated to, to that time. Um, but the rest of what you see in here is all a recreation of the late 19th century, again by the architect Hippolyte Blanc. So the floors, the timber panelling, the gallery, the fireplace at the other end, the window openings as you see them at the moment, and all the stained glass dates from the late 19th century. Whereas the roof is largely of the early 16th century, 1511, although the decoration of it and some repairs to the, uh, the structure were completed during the restoration works of the late 19th century. As you can see, this building houses a significant collection of arms and armour, um, so we're responsible for uh, its upkeep and um, conservation in situ here, and that gives us a, a number of challenges. Our collections colleagues are presently in the middle of a project to go through the whole of this collection here, um, to um, take it away and conserve it, and redo some of the fixings and mounts before they bring it back. The problem with the present ones is that there's quite a lot of metalwork being used and uh, got um, what look like bicycle clip type fixings um, and cable ties and various other metal clips which can do damage to the artifacts themselves. So they are sorting out some um, more appropriate mountings. Maintaining suitable conditions for the collection, for the arms and armour, which obviously contain lots of metalwork and bits of leather, is very important. And controlling the relative humidity um, within a specified range is the aim of the collections team. Um, and the relative humidity is actually used to control the heating system. The problem with the heating system is, although we have updated the boiler and the boiler controls, and the building management system, we're still relying on what in effect is a Victorian method of delivering heat, which is these cast iron pipes which tail around the building, as you can see. Um, there are two long runs um, and they get quite hot, they give out quite a lot of heat, but given the volume of the building and the um, thermal mass of the, uh, the floor and the structure, and the aerial infiltration through the uh, roof, which doesn't have any sarking felt on it, um, you can imagine that the heat, heat loss is enormous and it's difficult to actually maintain static conditions, steady conditions. 
this is made worse because this building is used for um, important government events. They quite often have um, dinner parties in here at night um, and uh, with speeches etc etc and people expect the sort of comfort conditions they've got used to and maintaining that with this kind of a heating system is really really difficult and sometimes we have to boost that with electric fan heaters for a short period of time before the meeting and that is obviously not good from the point of view of the, the timber panelling or the collection and it's certainly not good from our energy consumption point of view. This is Mons Meg on its timber carriage and you may remember when we came through the gatehouse we looked at the panel carved stone panels at high level in the archway. The gun was forged in Mons in 1449 and presented to James II by the Duke of Burgundy. came over here in 1457 and apart from a short period when it was taken down to the Tower of London has been on this site since then. It came back because of a big fuss been made by uh, Walter Scott and various others in the 19th century to bring it back to uh, Edinburgh Castle. This particular carriage was built in 1936 based on the, um, the representation that we saw and various other documentary evidence and was uh, made from two very large bulks of oak and we recently did some conservation work on this and repaired some internal rot and it's come back on site since then. The cannon itself, uh, the gun, is looked after by our collections colleagues and carefully monitored by them uh, and regularly um, inspected and um, repainted to reduce any um, damage through weathering, rust, etc. It's made up of iron hoops and staves, has a series of staves inside it and then iron hoops around it, like a barrel, which is why it's called a gun barrel. Um, but it's um, a magnificent um, piece of equipment um, but um, quite an interesting challenge to move around and lift when you have to do any maintenance work to it. We looked at the heating within the Great Hall. Um, the, remember the cast iron pipes snaking all the way around the, the building. We're now below the Great Hall in late 15th century vaults which were built to give a platform for Great Hall to be built on. Um, and you can see here this is the main boiler room which services provides heat to the Great Hall. Originally this would have been coal fired and we'll have a look at the coal hole in a minute. Um, but subsequent to that it was changed to gas heating and recently since 2011 we've um, spent quite a lot of time and effort our M&E team and others on updating all the um, equipment so we got modern gas boilers, um, variable speed pumps, a building management system and various other controls which allow us to optimise as far as we can uh, our energy consumption and the conditions which we can provide in the buildings. But as you can see doing anything like this in this kind of setting is problematic. Luckily here we already had a chimney flue which we could use for the main flue from these boilers um, to take that away otherwise that would have been a real issue. Obviously going forward there's going to be a problem with um, energy saving um, targets um, and what fuel we use. As I said we started um, doing this work in 2011 not only in this building on site but in the other buildings as well and not only to do with heating but also to do with all energy consumption that is um, cooking, lighting etc. And we've managed over the years since then to reduce the castle's energy consumption by about 30% um, by all these measure, measures, including what fabric insulation we can do as well. So follow me into the back and I'll show you what the, the old coal hole was like. Okay. 
And in here you can see within the old vault, um, Crown Square is up there and this is actually a chute down from Crown Square which is where the coal used to be tipped in. So this was the coal store for when they were, they used solid fuel boilers. Um, and down at low level here you can see the bedrock, Castle Rock actually protruding through which gives an idea of um, the kind of uh, leveling that they had to do to actually achieve a surface above and a platform for building the Great Hall. So we're going to go from here walking along what's called the Devil's Elbow um, along the passageway at the back of the, at the south side of the Great Hall and down onto uh, Dury's Battery and then around past the Western Defences and we'll have a look at the new barracks from there. The new barracks we saw next to Governor's House and you'll see what a huge building it is from, from that side. So we've walked along the wall walk outside the, just below the Great Hall from the boiler room, come down the stair there and across what's called Dury's Battery. You can also see from here, as we're heading down towards the new barracks, how the castle relates to Castle Rock, perched on the edge, and you can imagine what the problems are with doing conservation work there. It gets very expensive, arranging safe scaffold access, etc. The little projection on the end there is uh, one of the latrines. Um, before plumbed services came into the castle during the 19th, late 19th century, um, Castle Rock was um, the way for all the effluent um, down to the areas below, which was um, not very salubrious, as you can imagine, at times. Castle Rock itself, you can see here, it's a basalt, volcanic basalt, and the kind of um, fracture planes in it slope in various directions depending where you are around the site and this is one of the worst as you can see the slopes go down down slope towards the road below and this is one of the areas where historically there have been significant um, falls of rock so we have to take measures to reduce the risk of this and we have um, geotechnical engineers uh, who produce reports for us and do regular condition surveys and part of the uh, mitigation work that we've done more recently is to add a rock trap down the bottom by moving the boundary wall out by negotiation with the council. We took part of that road, Johnson Terrace Road, moved the existing wall out and put a rock trap in which catches the majority of the debris coming from this side. So we've walked down from Dury's Battery and we're now standing on the southwest corner of the New Barracks. The New Barracks. You may remember we saw the front elevation of this building when we were walking up through Middle Ward towards Foods Gate. And what you saw from there was in effect half of the height of the building. Here you can appreciate its true magnificence. A huge building. At the time it was called the Vulgar Cotton Mill by Walter Scott. Um, and it has a huge impact on this part of the site. It was built to house a field battalion of 600 men and it had uh, very few ablutions in when it was built so all those facilities were external to the building, they were only subsequently added. The veranda that you see here was added on 100 years later in about 1893 when the building was used as a hospital um, and we think that that was so they could um, get patients out to get, give them some fresh air. Although this being the southwest elevation, I think they probably got rather too much fresh air. And we don't think that the, the glazed roof on this would have lasted terribly long. The building is a major imposition on, on this side, um, but is one of the buildings on the site which is um, still occupied by the army. Um, the Army are one of um, several other um, third parties on the site, which include the National Museums of Scotland, the Scottish National War Memorial, and uh, the site caterers. But we do have an energy focus group which runs every few months, which gets all the occupants of the castle together, and we all try and pull in the same direction to reduce the energy bill of the site as a whole. We're coming to the end of our little uh, perambulation around Edinburgh Castle, which I hope you've enjoyed. We're now standing at the northwest corner above what's called the Western Defences, which were 
instituted by General Wade um, during the Jacobite Risings in the 18th century. Um, and you can appreciate from here how steep Castle Rock is on this corner and you can also appreciate how close it is to the main railway line which is a, a hazard obviously which has to be guarded against which is why this particular area of Castle Rock is uh, one of the few which has actually got um, netting on it to protect from rock falls. It's a very busy line. You get a very good view of um, the west of Edinburgh from here and on a good day you can even see the fourth bridge just peeking up over the top there together with the two road bridges, the newer and the older. So that's the end of our virtual tour. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Sorry you couldn't be here in person but I'm sure in future you'll turn up if you're anywhere near Edinburgh Castle. We hope you do. Um, we hope you found it interesting. I've only just scratched the surface really of what's available to see and of the history and archaeology of the place. But as I say, I hope you found it interesting and um, we look forward to seeing you at some time, hopefully in the very near future.